Welcome everybody. Thanks again for joining us. It'll be just a second while we get people jumping on. But thanks for joining us this Saturday afternoon for this very important webinar. I see that we've got some new friends and old friends joining us today. So thank you and welcome. I think just maybe one minute more Ramona and then we'll let you take it away. Okay, well, let's, uh, we're just kind of waiting on our end a little bit here. Welcome. Welcome again. We're just waiting for a few more people to hop on and we will begin. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. We are running a kind of a hybrid presentation today. We've got people in person at the new Autism Society of Kern Autism Network office. So they are doing an in-person and uh, and then we're going to be doing Zoom, which is being recorded. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, yes, my soon, let me work on that. I'm going to go ahead and, and mute. And I think we're just about ready. How are you doing on your end, Ramona? I've got a few people walking in right now, so. Okay. Let's start it and I'll quietly get them in. So as we're waiting, I think most people know by this time that um, if you are a participant in the webinar, we cannot see you or hear you. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We do have a Spanish interpreter today as well. Um, and if you need the interpretation, click on the globe and switch English or Spanish. Spanish. So, all right, ready, Ramona? Ready. All right, take it away. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ramona Puget, and I am the director for the Autism Society of Kern County. Uh, thank you all for being here today to help us address this topic that is one area of safety that is important to all families, especially uh, if we have a loved one with autism or a related disability. I want to thank our sister affiliate Autism Society of Inland Empire for joining us today to help us share this information to more families. I also want to thank our sponsors, Kern Family Healthcare of Bakersfield and Phoenixia of Inland Empire for their generous community support. An unexpected fire can occur when one least expects it and it can impact the life of any family. Today, this presentation was brought to light because of two special people, Feda and Mohammed, also known as Mu, who lives, who's, excuse me, I'm sorry, whose lives were tragically taken by a house fire a year ago in the Bay Area. We are humbled today to introduce two of their family members to share more about their project to honor their lives and remember their loved ones with dignity. Help me in welcoming Lubna and Maysoon sisters to Feda. Thank you. Thank you guys for uh, doing this for the community and everything. Uh, Lubna, are you there? Yes, hi, how are you? Thank you everybody for help for doing this um, for, for fire safety and specifically, you know, we know that this was, became a big topic because of our huge loss with Fida and Mu. And we've worked um, on putting together a project um, to help bring awareness around the tips and things that can be done annually to help promote emergency preparedness. Misun, do you want to um, kind of talk about it? Well, if I can share the screen, I don't know if that's possible for us to show it. Beth? Absolutely. Okay. Misun, maybe you want to um, talk about it while I set it up? 
So the website is a, a simple resource that um, is not just about fire safety, but also about wandering prevention, um, how to prepare for natural disasters, specifically for the autism uh, community and um, you know, children and adults who suffer from develop developmental disabilities. Um, but you know, even for any family, regardless, I think the fire safety would help you know, even if you didn't have a child or an adult in the home that uh, wasn't capable of understanding that there was an imminent danger and, and how to respond and where to go and, you know, what to do in that, in that scenario. Um, and I, I think we, you know, we can summarize everything we've done in this really great video um, that talks about it and what our, what our goal is and, and ideally how we would like this to uh, how we like to continue their their legacy and and hopefully save lives in honor of you know uh, their death. So the um, if you could, uh, play it and then enlarge it. My cousin Mo was a really loving kid with severe autism. He was almost sixteen years old, and he was a really big guy. He was sometimes really stuck. So I know it was very scary, very hard for my outfit out and get him down the stairs. I woke up choking from the smoke and I was screaming for my mom and it woke everyone up except for them. Well, the family was sleeping, flames ripped through this Fremont home early this morning. Relatives tell us Feda Almalidi and her 15 year old son, Boo, who has autism, died in the fire. But the impact that you've had on your son, on your family, on, on other families, on the field, that is a tremendous gift. And I know that sometimes you're like, I don't even have a high school diploma. Who am I to be doing this? Who am I to be writing these articles? But what I see is this like kick ass amazing person. In an emergency, how do you prevent tragedy and protect your family from such a senseless loss and death? Our purpose is simple. Every year on and around September 26, we'll provide advice, guidance, and reminders to families with children and adults with autism and developmental disabilities on how to prepare for emergencies, whether they are fires, earthquakes, floods, or any other natural disasters. We want your family, your kids, parents, and caregivers to be safe. Our website is designed to be easy to use and share featuring both simple and elaborate steps you can take. So if disaster strikes, you will have the ability and the fighting chance the dad Muhammad did not have. This response and collective effort is the act of love we have for Fadad and Moon and the love Fadad and Moon had for anyone that touched their lives. We hope this will continue their beautiful and heroic legacy that Fadad and Moon put into motion. It was the only way we could take this pain and turn it into a powerful action that we hope will save lives. So please, mark your calendars, print out your checklists, and check the tiny details in life, like fixing or checking if your smoke protectors work on your lives. She was a fighter to the end, and this was her last fight that we hope will save your life and the people you love. From her life's work to your death, they will never stop fighting for you because this is like an oasis of, of hope and love because that's what you built. You built this. My aunt Fada was a very strong and brave woman. I didn't want parents to suffer like I did. I didn't want one more family, you know, to go through the almost sleepless nights not knowing that their, if their kid's gonna make progress or if they can get the therapy for them. I just didn't want another mom or dad to go through what I went through. I cared about the kids, but I feel like people forget sometimes the plight of the parents. It's really easy to look at a kid with autism and feel sympathy for them. It's a whole other thing to look at their families. I don't understand what they're going through. I don't. But I know that I do everything I love. Yeah, my kid, really. Yeah. Like, I have royals and I can't. Yeah. This is right or nice shit right there.
Um, thank you, Beth, for arranging this. And once again, um, the website september26.org.org. And we, we tried to make it as simple as possible. You can, um, you can complete the checklists uh, for each, for each uh, type of emergency. And we will hope to be adding more um, content as, as time goes by. So um, unless me soon you have anything to add, I wanted to give the floor back to you guys. Um, and there's a part on the website where uh, anybody can submit a tribute for Fida and Moo, as well as uh, fallen angels, um, you know, families who've lost um, other children, adults uh, in emergencies, or even from, you know, just from their, their condition. I, I just wanted to create tribute pages um, so we can share stories and keep the, you know, Fidan Wu and many others memory in your lives, you know, always to be remembered. So, um, and just please share it. Please share it. That's, that's about yes. it. Thank you. We hope this helps. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luna and my soon. Um, we will share this link with our families to visit the website that was created for this special project. Uh, we actually have it set up to, uh, to air on the dates that we were told that uh, it needed to go out. So it, it is set up so that everyone can see that. So thank you again. Uh, now to begin our presentation, I'm going to read a brief bio of our speaker for today. Uh, Captain William A. Kanata Jr., he was retired. Uh, we know him as Bill. Uh, Bill was a member of the fire service for 35 years. Uh, Bill had been an officer with the Westwood Fire Department for 15 years. Uh, he was also a Massachusetts Fire Academy instructor for 15 years. Uh, Bill became a member of Autism and Law Enforcement Education Coalition, known as ALEC, in November of 2003. In January of 2006, he became the statewide coordinator of ALEC. ALEC currently educates first responders across the state of Massachusetts and throughout the world uh, about autism spectrum disorders and how to better understand a person who is on the spectrum. ALEC has trained over 50,000 first responders throughout the United States. Bill is also a parent of a child with ASD. Help me in welcoming Bill. Thank you, Ramona. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, looking at that uh, website for September 26th project, uh, it, it's phenomenal. And it's quite a program that's going to save lives. And that's what we need, the resources for uh, our families, autism families, to go to, to learn about safety. Because we, we you know, we're so busy every day with everyday life, trying to manage our lives and manage our kids. And sometimes we put safety to the side, but uh, after this incident, it's a reminder that we really need to prepare for anything, okay? And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a, a PowerPoint. We're gonna go through this PowerPoint and then we're gonna have a Q and A, send your questions throughout. And at the end, we're gonna go through the questions. Okay, let me get on board here with the share. The technology is always my biggest obstacle. So can we see that, Beth? We good? You are great. Okay, that's good. That's a good start then. Okay, and again, uh, Ramona read my, my bio. Uh, firefighter in the fire service for 35 years and uh, also have been doing autism awareness training for first responders now for 18 years. So, and how this got going is uh, I took my professional life as a firefighter and also being an autism dad, I said, I gotta introduce these two worlds so we better know each other and understand each other. And that's how uh, our ALEC project in Massachusetts came about. And what we're finding is uh, first responders want to know this information. They want to be better prepared for emergencies for people on a spectrum. And, uh, and I'm 
happy to share this information. I feel that my son, his name is Ted, and he would want me to share information about him to my peers in, in the fire service. Uh, Alec, we also train police officers, EMTs and paramedics, hospitals, and uh, some school systems how to interconnect with first responders. So those are, uh, that, that's what I've been doing now for 18 years. And uh, uh, we've had some great success and we get a lot of great stories where it's worked and that's, that's our goal. Okay, our sponsors again today, uh, Ramona uh, said them at the beginning here. It's the Austin Society Current, Current Autism Network up in Bakersfield and Inland Empire. That's uh, Beth, and where are you Beth? Riverside, California, correct? Okay, and the current family. Riverside and San Bernardino counties. Okay, and uh, current family healthcare is a sponsor, and Phoenixia Foundation. Hopefully, I said that right. Okay, so you saw the opening uh, that told a lot about the day of September 26, 2020. Very tragic. Okay. Early hours, early night fire, which is common. Okay, had his sister and niece escape. A fetter went back, tried to get Mu out, and they were lost in the fire. Okay, when the fire officials found the bodies, fetter was embracing Mu, so she got to him, but they couldn't get out. So that's the kind of person she was. She's always, from what I've heard about her, just helping anybody, and she tried her best to, to save Moo that night. Um, this story, as I, I follow all the news feeds internationally, and this repeats itself probably three or four times a year. Okay, it, it is a problem. Uh, it's either our loved ones will not leave a burning building because uh, home is their safe place. So they feel they're gonna be safe in their home, so they won't leave. Others do get out, they escape, or they with family members will take them to a safe place and they'll run back into the burning building because that's what they know is home is their safe place. So uh, it's, it's just happening at an alarming rate and education is how we're gonna beat this, teaching family safety and also the fire service and how we can work together to have better results. Uh, unfortunately, the reporting systems in the United States, we don't know how many times uh, a year this happens because no data is collected uh, for this type of incident. It's unfortunately, it's just very broad. It's just, it's just um, a, a fire incident with a disability, but they don't break it down. So, so we don't really have some numbers. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through um, what fires are and their causes and how we can best prepare for them uh, through this presentation. Okay, so house fires are the leading cause of all fire deaths in the United States, okay? So it's at home and this is where we have to make these preparations. Okay, according to the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA, I'm gonna quote them a lot today, because they're the agency that collects a lot of data. And I'm gonna share this with you just to give you an idea of what's happening nationally. So uh, fire departments respond to about 400,000 home fires that kill almost 2,900 people, approximately eight people per day across the United States. And most of these house fires, they are preventable and survivable, okay? But we still have high numbers of people uh, that we lose because not being prepared. All right, there's little time. And this is really key to today is you don't have a lot of time to get out. Okay, in less than 30 seconds, a small flame can get completely out of control and turn into a major fire. Okay, it can be that fast. And it only takes minutes for thick black smoke to fill a house and minutes a house can be engulfed in flames. Most fires occur in the home when people are asleep. Nighttime fires are most common. And if you wake up to a fire, you won't have time to grab your valuables because the fire spreads too quickly and the smoke is too thick and there is only time to escape. 
Okay, so it's it, it's fast. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about smoke detectors, early detection. That's why they're important. So you can get as much time as possible to escape. And in our case with somebody on the spectrum, it's more challenging because we have to get them out. Okay, and that's, and I use my family situation that that's gonna be a challenge. Okay, and this is why we, we need to have this protection and also prepare for a fire by conducting home drills and having the safety devices in place. All right, fire is hot, okay? Heat is more threatening than the flames, all right? Because the flames will be uh, in one part of the building, but that heat will travel throughout, okay? The heat alone can kill. Room temperatures in the fire can be 100 degrees at floor level and rise to 600 degrees at eye level. Okay, so if you remember that, back, uh, when we teach you to get down on the floor and crawl, that's why 100 degrees versus 600 degrees. Okay, if you inhale that super hot air, it'll scorch your lungs. Okay, and this heat can melt you close to your skin, and in five minutes, a room can get so hot that everything at night at once. This is called flashover. And uh, if you get the flashover, you cannot survive that. Even firefighters in full turnout gear may die in a flashover situation. That's how intense a flashover can be. Okay, fire isn't bright, it's pitch black. Now I know you see the movies, Hollywood, that these firefighters go running in without their breathing apparatus on and sometimes with their coats open because that's a macho thing to do, I guess. And they, they rescue people and they put fire out and it's no problem. That, is, that couldn't be the furthest from the truth, okay? Because uh, what happens is fire starts bright but quickly produces black smoke and complete darkness. You can't see uh, an inch in front of you. It's, it's pitch, pitch black. Okay, you wake up to a fire, you may be blinded, disoriented and unable to find your way around the home you've lived in for years. Okay, you, you may crawl out of your bedroom, you don't even know where you are. And it's a place you've lived for a long time, and you can easily get lost. All right, smoke and toxic gases kill more people than the flames do. All right, and this is, this is true. Um, what happens is fire will be in one area, but the gases and the toxic fumes travel throughout a structure. Okay, if you remember back, it was, uh, I think in the 80s, the high rise fires in uh, Las Vegas, the fire was on the first floor, but people died from these gases and smoke on the 44th floor. So that just gives you an idea of how this can travel. Okay, they were nowhere near the fire. Okay, so the fire uses up the oxygen you need and produces the smoke and poisonous gases that kill. So it takes that away. Breathing even small amounts of smoke and toxic gases can make you drowsy, disoriented, and short of breath. The odorless, colorless fumes can lull you to deep sleep before the flames reach your door. You may not wake up in time to escape. Okay, so what, it, what that does is it's just basically, it's knocking you out and making you unable to act appropriately you can't you you actually pass out and the biggest piece in there it's the carbon monoxide in the in the in the smoke and what that does in times it makes you uh, pass out so therefore it's going to slow your responses down okay the leading causes of fires in the home let me put them all up here cooking heating electrical smoking and candles. Okay, so these are the major causes of uh, fires in the home. Okay, cooking fires are the number one cause of home fires and home injuries. Okay, a lot of our burn injuries are from cooking incidents. And the leading cause of fires in the kitchen is unattended cooking. So this is uh, something you need to practice. If you are cooking in the kitchen, you stay with it. Okay, if you're heating something on a stove and you have to step away, you may want to turn it off and then come back to it or put a timer on it for a minute or two just to remind you that your stove is on. 
Okay, that's that's a good practice. I mean, I do that all the time. I'm trying to boil something or cook something, you walk away and forget about it. But then the timer goes off and you can get back and attend to it. All right, but that's the number one, it's uh, cooking. Heating is the second leading cause of home fires and uh, fire injuries and the third leading cause of home fire deaths. So it's heating systems, okay? And then again, these are the numbers here, uh, 48,535 is involved in heating equipment per year and accounting for 14% of all reported home fires during this time, okay? Um, what, how to prevent these uh, heating fires is maintenance of equipment. Okay, make sure that your uh, furnace is uh, at least once a year serviced and to make sure that it is safe, okay? Because it, it is a, the number two cause of uh, fires. Electricity uh, helps make our lives easier, but there are times when we can take its power and its potential for fire-related hazards for granted. Okay, so electrical fires are common. I mean, the, the best thing we can do is make sure that the equipment is working properly. And if it's not, to have an electrician come in and service it, don't, don't let it go. Okay, if you have a hot light switch, then electrician needs to come in and fix it or, or an outlet. Okay, so don't just let it go. The circuit needs to be shut down and a uh, licensed electrician should come in and make sure everything is working properly. Smoking is one of the, uh, it's it's a one of the leading causes. I think it's number three, and we see this so often. It's lessened over the years. I think there's less people smoking, but we we still are finding uh, home fires started by careless disposal is mostly the problem. So uh, so smoking materials, including cigarettes, pipes, and cigars, down an estimated of seventeen thousand two hundred home structure fires in the U.S. in two thousand and fourteen. And these fires cause um, 570 deaths. So uh, 1,140 injuries and uh, 40, uh, 426 million in direct property damage, okay? So, and then again, all these other stats here, but um, most of it's careless disposal and uh, just not paying attention of what you're doing with the uh, when you're discarding uh, the smoking materials. Uh, we had an incident uh, just down the street from me where a, uh, a lady, she had her cigarette before she went to bed. She threw the cigarette out, it landed into the mulch, and she woke up 15 minutes later and her whole house was on fire because the mulch started on fire and burned up the side of the building and she lost her home home and she was lucky to escape. Okay, so that's one of the other causes. Okay, from... 2014 to 18, fire departments responded to an estimated 7,610 home structure fires that were started by candles. Okay, we, we, we do see a lot of these. And uh, again, the candles are left unattended or they're left burning overnight when people aren't aware. And what they do is they burn down, the wax can catch fire and catch the catch the contents of the house on fire. So uh, it, it is a big number there. So if you're using candles, be very careful with them. So as I, my wife liked to use candles, but I changed her over now, we use the battery kinds. So they're a lot safer. <laughs> but if we do have open candles, uh, we, we make sure that they're out when we either leave the house or we go to bed at night, okay? And again, um, for these top causes, I'm going to direct you to the website here. It's the NFPA's website, and uh, it's the uh, public education fire causes and risks and top fire causes. And I'm going to give you this uh, website again later on, because uh, this has a lot of, NFPA has a lot of information, not only for uh, how to prevent house fires, but also uh, protection for people with disabilities. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Home sprinklers, all right, um, highly recommended, okay? Uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of them put into private homes, all right? The, uh, the builders have chosen not to offer that, and I think it's a cost-saving measure for them. 
So um, if, if you're able to get into a house with a sprinkler, that's your best protection that you're gonna have. But uh, if you're looking for an apartment or a condo, um, look for one that has fire sprinkler systems in it because most of the codes today require that size building to have fire sprinklers in it. So definitely it's a big plus when, when you're going to rent and it's a sprinkled system. It's the safest one uh, that you could live in, okay? Anything that's sprinkled, any complex that's sprinkled. Um, very, very, very few fatalities in sprinkled uh, buildings. And if there is a fatality, there was under other circumstances that led to it. So probably the safest thing that you could have uh, in a structure. Okay, the smoke alarms. Okay, the codes are, well, the, I won't say the codes, the NFPA recommendation is install smoke alarms in every sleeping room. They should also be outside of each sleeping area and on every level of the home. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna say is, if you don't have them in your sleeping rooms, you don't need them in there, but as long as they're outside of the bedrooms in the hallway, okay, that's, that's safe that way. Um, every level of the house, yes, you need them on each floor, okay? If, it, if it's, a, if it's a, a two story home, you want one at the bottom of the stairs on the first floor and one to the top of the stairs on the second floor and then outside of the bedroom, okay? And uh, if it's a, a say a one story home, a long ranch house, make sure the distance is not more than 20 feet between the detectors. So that way you can have the protection as the fire progresses, the smoke will come to these detectors and it will sound there and give you more time. It's what we talked about, having more time. And um, for, for us, with, with kids on the spectrum, I know uh, a lot of people say the, the smoke alarms, the noise really bothers them and it, it can, that is correct with a lot of them, but what we have to do is still practice the drills with these guys so they understand why they're going off and what they need to do. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, test your smoke alarm at least once a month by pushing the test button. If you can't reach them, ask for help, okay? So test it, make sure that the alarm works. That's what's keeping you safe. And what you need to do is at least once a year, change the batteries, okay? If it's one of those types. Another type that they're putting out, it's a more popular one now, is a 10 year battery in them. So you don't have that issue anymore. You can just put the smoke detector up, put the date on it, if you have space to write the date and just check it, uh, doing your checks and also check the date. Okay, and if you just put it up, you know it's gonna be a little while to get 10 years. But uh, it's, it's a easy thing to do, okay? Place it and check it. Uh, what I recommend also is for smoke detectors, ones that are combination smoke and carbon monoxide. So you'll get an alarm for carbon monoxide issue and a smoke or fire problem. Okay, so that really, that's keeping you even more safe by having it that way. All right. So again, this is the one I just mentioned, the 10-year batteries. Okay, those, those are great. And they need to be replaced every 10 years, any smoke detector, whether it's 10-year batteries or batteries that you change annual, annually. They have to be replaced every 10 years because they become less effective after 10 years. And again, we, we have to have them effective as possible so we can get that early warning. Okay? And we need that quickly. Okay, escape planning. Include everyone in the home in the escape planning. Okay, and, and just work in, okay, have teams uh, come up with your, your meeting area, but everybody should participate. Okay, even our loved ones on the spectrum. Now, with my son, you know, he wouldn't know what to do um, if the alarm goes off, really meant nothing to him. So what we had to do was give it, some, give it a purpose. 
So if the alarm would go off, to him that meant it was time to go outside and we could watch his iPad outside, okay? And uh, we had a, a camper trail and we could go there and watch it. Or another one of our, our instructors with Alec, his family would meet at the family van and they would play his favorite audio tapes and um, that would work. They just run to the van and be safe in the van. So, and they practice that drill. So, and so that way everybody knew what to do. And again, that's what it takes is practice. It's, uh, the more we do it and we know we're teaching our kids uh, with autism, uh, we just have to keep doing trials and this should be part of it while you're at home. Just take that few minutes to do a drill and do it at different times of the day if, if possible. Okay, so they can better understand it and it becomes somewhat of a routine is what we're looking for. Okay. So everybody should be included on these home drills. Um, <clears throat> keep a phone by your bed in case you can't escape and you need to call for help. All right, and um, that's today with uh, cell phones, mobile phones, it's easy to do. Just keep it there and be at the ready. Okay. And again, a lot of systems today, reporting systems, uh, I know talking with Ramona ahead of time, they have Smart 911 in, uh, in their county. And uh, a system like that is great because when you call in, for an emergency, all of your information is coming up on the dispatch screen. And if you have a loved one uh, on the spectrum, you can put that into that dispatch screen and uh, you're able to manage it uh, at home. So, so if you have that type of program, if you have Smart 911 in your community, definitely uh, use that. Okay? That way they know they can pass that information on to responding units before they even arrive, they can be prepared for for, uh, for that type of rescue. Okay, <clears throat> talking with the fire department. And um, some departments have fire and life safety people that'll assist you with your escape plans. And uh, so you need to check with your departments to see if they have any material to help you out. Some, <clears throat> some will, they have dedicated personnel to do it. Um, some will direct you to the NFPA website for information. And the NFPA website also has uh, a section planning your escape, okay, with, with some maps that you could work with to help, help you design an escape plan uh, for you and your family. Okay, ask them to review the plan. If you, if you develop your own, somebody should be able to help you with that. And then again, the directory, if it's Smart 911, they have it. If you don't have Smart 911, check with your department to see if there's a place where you can register uh, at least your loved ones on the spectrum so they know where they are and uh, that they'll need some extra assistance uh, in case of an emergency. Okay, if you have a service animal, animal uh, agree on the plan to keep the animal with you during an emergency. Okay, so that again, that should be upfront, especially in an evacuation situation uh, so they can be prepared for that. Okay, safety in the home. Again, a uh, couple of websites here, the Autism Society uh, of America, uh, they have a section on safety in the home and other safety issues. Um, good, good site with, with a lot of good information, especially it's geared towards uh, people with autism. And then the NFPA's uh, site where, where people with disabilities. Okay, so you can go onto those websites and look for further information that'll assist you with your fire plans and more about home safety and devices that you uh, could purchase uh, to keep your home safe. Okay, fire drills at school. All right, I know, and I've seen this over the years working in the fire service, often what happens is uh, with Classrooms with kids with autism in it, they don't participate. And I asked why when I would uh, go to perform a fire drill and they said, the noise bothers them. So what are we teaching them? We're not teaching them any safety at all. And that's wrong. 
because as I said, I, I talked with the uh, principal at that school and I said, well, this is a school they had to learn. Why can't they learn fire safety? And he looked at me and said, you're right. So he changed his way. So everybody participated in that drill. So we need to make sure that that uh, does happen. That's a question you can ask in the classroom. Are they participating? And then you can work together. What's going to work best for these individuals? And um, is it going to be uh, noise canceling headphones that will help them through that or chewy toys or anything that's going to help them? Often you can get a grab bag ready to go if there's a fire drill. Have the grab bag ready and they go outside and they can take care of you know, they, those issues will help them get through it. But they can do it. Okay, so the fire drill is a change in routine. So we have to shift them into that mode. And the problems we can have is a secondary route. If they're not in the classroom, that may be difficult for them because they just don't. They, often what we see is they try to go back to the classroom then, then to escape uh, their normal route. So again, it's just practice in the school and from a different classroom is the same thing. Okay. So you can put safety issues into an IEP, all right? If you're concerned about it and you feel that they need to be addressed when you meet with a team, put the safety issues in there, okay? It's, it's, it's a good thing to do. And again, this, again, with the fire drill, it's gonna be helpful that they can develop a plan. Often they use the, firefighters when they come in uh, for their inspections and work with them to find out the best way that they can work together. Okay, quarterly goals need to be obtained. Uh, modification of the program, if unsuccessful, you don't succeed, try it again. Okay, make it work. Okay, and this is where the team knows the individuals and they'll be able to work up a plan that's going to be catered for that individual. So a lot of people ask, oh, can we just have a sheet for people with autism and, and fire drills? And I said, no, because it's very individual. We have to know the individual, what their needs are and uh, what the goals we can set to, to, to meet the goal of safety. All right, so it is, it is individual for these guys. Make the goals once they're obtained, okay? Once they make, make these goals, we have to just make sure that they keep practicing so they don't forget. And um, what happens is with all of us, a lot of fire safety is done in the early years of school, elementary school, maybe a little bit in middle school, but then it kind of stops in high school, okay? So a lot of our guys with autism, they lose that in high school and then they go off to college and it's non-existent at a campus, okay? So, so really, do they know how to escape? So this is something when our loved ones move on to college that we need to address, okay? How are they gonna know how to get out during a fire? And I bring this up because of this uh, website here, the Michael H. Minger Foundation uh, was created for this issue. And it's created because Michael's mother, Gail Menger, a good friend of mine, lost Michael in a dorm fire because he didn't know how to escape. So this is now her mission in life is to promote campus fire safety. And a uh, very, very great program for if you have somebody who's going off to university, college, check this website out. There's a lot of good tips here to for these indiv individuals to prepare for safety, okay? So very, very important. So we, we, we have to stay fire safe throughout our whole lives. And these are the steps we can take for our loved ones. Okay, now we'll go into uh, Q&A. And let me stop my share. Okay, one thing, I, and I forgot to bring it up, and for some reason my video didn't click on, but, um, when you go to bed at night, close your doors, okay? We talked about the heat, the smoke, and the gases. That's a barrier that's going to give you more time to escape, okay? So just 
close the door as you go to bed, it's gonna buy you some more time. As we said, especially with our individuals on the spectrum, we need all the time we can get. And that's why the importance is early detection, smoke detectors are gonna give us that time so we can get out. And again, with all the preparation we need to do, the drills, all of that is definitely, there's a lot of work, but it's, it's the way we have to be and it's the safest way you're gonna escape a home fire. Okay, so Beth, do you have any questions for me in the queue? I do not right now, but if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A, but I will, this is something, um, Bill, you and I had talked about is part of the safety plan. Um, isn't it true that often sometimes individuals with off, uh, autism, if they get out of the house, will run away? And yes, part of the yes. safety plan, yeah, might include um, can you talk a little bit about that is having somebody responsible to make sure they're not running away? Right. Okay. As, as we said, uh, when we es when we escape the burning building and we have a safety place to go, which is designated by every family, but somebody should be assigned to that individual at all times. Okay. Somebody stays with the person with autism because they said a lot of them are running back into the burning buildings. Uh, when we train firefighters, when they arrive on scene, if there is a person on the spectrum, that one of the firefighters will stay with that person until they've been taken to a safe area. Usually it's an ambulance. We try and get them in there. It's a safe area. So, so at all times, it has to be hands on that individual. Because as I said before, home is their safe place. So that's where they're trying to get back to because it's what they know. It's, it's, their, it's their safe place and it doesn't matter if it's on fire. Um, there was a situation uh, I'll talk about. It was in Knoxville, Tennessee. It was a 25 year old who was not trapped by the fire, but he wouldn't leave the house. And the family had to abandon him because it, it, was, it was hot. So when the firefighters arrived, they grabbed him, tried to pull him out and he fought them off. And the firefighters had to withdraw and he was still in there. So they put their gear back together because this individual, he, he, he ripped their helmets off and their, and their masks off. So they put themselves back together and got a couple more firefighters and took four of them to get out of that house. And when they got him out, he had second and third degree burns on his neck from the flames over his head. So he just didn't get it. And even though he was burning, it still wouldn't make him leave. So that's what it is. They just don't have the understanding. And again, this was his home. He wasn't going to leave. And luckily, he survived. So we were, we were happy about that. Okay. That is good. Uh, Ramona, did you want to ask your question or do you want me to ask it? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I'm actually typing them in. If you want to go ahead and start with the first one I did, and I'm going to keep typing here. Okay, that sounds good. So um, here's a question. What types of planning helps with houses that have bars on windows or enclosed cage front doors? What do you think about that one? That, that, that's for rescue for firefighters, that's one of the biggest obstacles. And again, what you, the smoke detectors are what's going to save you in this type of situation. Um, if if you live in a, in a place like that where you have that, that type of security on there, the fire department needs to know about that, that that's where you're living and you do have uh, a person with a disability there. Uh, early detection is your best escape there because your windows are no longer, the only way out is, is the door, okay? And um, again, what we need to also practice on any fire is two ways out in case one way is blocked. Okay, so no two different ways out of your house. But yeah, that is that is probably uh, the most difficult rescue is with bars on the windows and, and the doors. So early detection is a must there. There's a similar question. I'm in a middle apartment, second level. 
the bedrooms have windows. What happens if there's a fire blocking the door? So somebody's on the second floor. Okay, and if that's the only way out and you can't get out, um, you need to keep the door closed, call 911 and tell them where you are and tell them that you're trapped and get to the window. Okay, and hopefully uh, what they'll do is they'll come in. If they know that ahead of time, they're gonna get the ladders into the, by the window and get you out there. Do we register our kiddos on the spectrum with the fire department? If they're able to, if they have a registry, all right, as, as we mentioned earlier, not every department has one. Uh, Smart 911, if you community Smart 911 community, you can register them on their website. Okay, because what it is is Smart 911 is it's uh, uh, a community purchases this program and it's for anybody in the community to add information, not only about people with autism, but anybody. So, and any pertinent information in your house. So uh, check with your fire department to see if they do have a, what, what it's generally called is an at-risk registry. So see if they have that. And if they do, go ahead and register. But one thing I'm gonna say, if you move, let them know so they can remove, remove you from that registry. And Bill, that's the non-emergency fire department number, right? That family correct. Lady call. Yes, correct. Call the business line. What they yes. can. Another question. Are there any covers or protection boxes available to put over smoke alarms if your child or adult pulls them off uh, and you have a low ceiling? Okay. Um, they do make some. It's like a cage that you can put over it. And uh, again, that would be uh, something you could check with a, a hardware store. Okay, most commonly they used in uh, industrial places uh, because uh, so, so the equipment isn't damaged uh, with uh, machinery or uh, with materials. But uh, the application, if you have that issue in a home, uh, that, that what you could do is put, put their little wire cage that you can put over it so you can't have the access to it. And it'll still, it won't uh, impede the uh, detective from responding because uh, the smoke's still gonna get to it. Is there a best brand or easy to install smoke alarm? There are many different brands out there. And I'm gonna say all of the common ones, uh, they're, they're easy to install. And um, you can buy them at any of the uh, big hardware stores, Home Depot, Lowe's. Um, and I, I'm going to say they're all UL rated. So, and they, you, you, what you do is you read the functions of the detector. Some are just smoke detectors, but I recommend the smoke and the CO carbon monoxide detectors. Okay. And again, there's several brands out there and they're all equally as good. Um, and I'll just jump in and say, uh, for the individuals that are on today, you guys will all be receiving a three pack of smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, uh, courtesy of Phenexia Foundation. So that's something you guys will be finding more information out on Monday. Um, is it a good idea to purchase a window ladder to have for an upstairs bedroom? Yes. Okay. It, it is because if uh, we'll go back to the two ways out and actually that the person that said about the, the window before it is uh, an item that you can purchase. If that's going to make your second way out, the ladder will work. Okay. And that's, that's a, uh, I'm going to call it the last resort as coming out the window onto that ladder is it's, it's very difficult to do. Okay, but if it's your last resort, then yes, use it. Okay, and think about it, you know, with, with somebody uh, with autism trying to maneuver that too. With my son, I don't think he could do it. It would be very difficult for him. So again, it's gonna be a judgment call for you if you have to use that. But again, if, if that's your second way out, then yes, I would have it available as, as a last resort. So that Yes, go ahead, Ramona. You might want to make the, so 
Our families that are here today that are here in person are actually getting fire blankets. Yes. That Thank you. So you might want to clarify that for the group that's on Zoom. The yes, Zoom so that's the individuals on Zoom are getting smoke detectors. The individuals that are in person are getting fire blankets. So okay. thank you, Ramona. Right, and the fire blanket, that's gonna, that's gonna buy you some time also if you're trapped, especially. Okay, and that's again, the importance of having, having that phone nearby. So you can call 911 and tell them that you are trapped. Because what they typically when, when they get a report that somebody's trapped is they upgrade the response. They send extra, extra firefighters there and they try to pinpoint your location so, so they can perform a rescue. Yeah. I, I was going to go back and say I purchased after um, Beta and Moo passed away, I ended up purchasing a fire ladder for my son because he's on a second story bedroom and, you know, spent $90 off of Amazon and we got it in there and tried to use it and it was terrifying. Like I couldn't use it, let alone he looked at me it's, like I was crazy. <laughs> like, no, it, I'm not it, going down that. <laughs> you, you, you think of the mechanics of that, you know, it, it, it drapes over the, the windowsill, but it's, it's, it's like a rope, you know, it's the rope and it's going to be, you know, very wiggly and difficult to maneuver. And that's why I, I, I'd say it's, it's good to have as your second out as a last resort. Okay. And the best thing is, even if you are going to use that, Call 911 and tell them that you're trapped and you need to get out. That's good. Um, can you talk a little bit again about where online uh, families can find a home safety plan and recommend any resources? Okay, and the, um, the um, let me get the uh, site there. The NFPA uh, is probably the best one for the uh, home safety plan. And let me just grab my notes here and... Um, Yes. Okay. It's uh, nfpa.org public education backslash public education. Beth, our group actually got copies of that. Yeah. Yes. And we'll yeah, be it's, sending it's, it's, out the PowerPoint uh, on Monday as well, as long with the copy of the recording. Okay. So all, all of those sites are on there. Okay. Perfect. And that, and uh, I don't know if the September 26 site is I'll live in, yet. I'll include that. Yeah, I'm not it's, sure. I don't think it's live work. yet. I think they're close, but I, I, I did look at it uh, last week and uh, so far I, I, I feel it's excellent. Okay, and I think it's really gonna help a lot of families. Because uh, again, the, the, the biggest uh, concern with our individuals on the spectrum is the number one killer is the drowning and it's wandering issues. So, so that's, they have a lot of information about how to prevent wandering. And um, so very, very important. So all, all of what they have on there is very important. So, and I look forward to seeing that finished product launched. So we're talking about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ramona. So for those of you that are here on uh, the 23rd, I believe it is when they said we could share it. Uh, we actually have it showing up on our Facebook, on our feed, and it'll actually have the link so you can go on there and you can actually visit that website that uh, the sisters shared with us today. So it's actually coming up as a, uh, as a post. And so you'll actually be able to go on there and look at it and so on and so forth and save it on whatever you want, but it'll be on there. And then we'll actually have it placed on our website uh, as soon as we're able to get that link in there too. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Perfect. so that's good. And again, look at look at the other websites too. Um, yeah, NFPA has uh, uh, some detail in there. Uh, the Autism Society website, uh, the National, has uh, information. It just look everywhere you can and uh, find what's going to work best for you. Okay, it, it's everybody has different needs, so check all these sites and see what's going to be your best fit. Kind um, of on that. Same line, one of the questions is, what type of safety goals can you recommend in an IEP? Okay, the safety goals, uh, I mean, it could be numerous things. I mean, it, it can be the fire drills at school because you know, the IEP is kind of, it, it, it's set for your school setting. So, uh, so that they participate in the fire drill, that they uh, mostly will practice 
and you develop a plan for the individual, uh, a practice plan. What's, what's going to, how's, how are they going to uh, get through this and practice this plan, you know, every day, uh, several times a day. I mean, it's just like we write any other uh, goal in an IEP, work out a safety plan, what's going to work for the individual, all right, the alarm sounds, what are they going to do next? What's the first thing they're going to do? Is it going to be have their go kit, put a headset on, or are they going to learn to exit the building with, with the teacher? So it, it, it's, again, it's, it's very individual. And there was, we had actually one in, uh, in my district where uh, the individual was petrified of the fire alarm. So what we did was we, we made a plan that he was going to help us. And his job was when the fire alarm went off that he would leave the building, but his job was to make sure nobody else went back into that building. And so they gave him a job. And so he was able to tolerate the alarm because as soon as the alarm went off, he says, I have my job to do. And he was so good at his job that the fire chief came in and he wouldn't let the fire chief in because it wasn't safe. <laughs> and, then, and then the fire chief said, it's okay. And the fire chief and walked by him. And this kid was big. He was like over six feet. He bear hugged him and carried him out into the back outside the building and said, you can't go in there. <laughs> So good for him. That's great. <laughs> but again, it's it's it is it's very individual to to cater a plan uh, per person, and yeah, and again, working as a team, you can find those details. Okay, you can also put wandering safety in there, and uh, you know any any other uh, safe practices in the building. Uh, a big one that is now that we have with us, unfortunately, is active shooter drills. Okay, and. Um, and you can see the uh, challenges that kids on the spectrum would have with that. So again, come up with a plan that's gonna work. And a lot of, uh, I see, again, it's another grab bag with chewy toys in there, something to entertain them to keep them quiet. So all Great of these ideas. things, yeah, all of these things you work with the classroom teacher and the team with the IEP to keep these guys safe. But today's subject is the fire safety and have them be included into the fire drills and not taken out of the building before a drill happens. And Bill, we were also talking about, I mean, it's very important in the school, but it's, it's equally as important at home. And I know that there's some um, BCBAs that are working with some of the ABA companies to work on home safety goals like fire safety because um, just because you learn it at school doesn't mean it generalizes to home, right? That's, that's correct, right. And that's the importance of the home drills, designing a home drill and, uh, and how to escape and trying to keep them out of that house if it is on fire. So again, yeah, that's, it's, it's good practice is to come up with a plan that's going to work and practice it several times because that's how a lot of our guys learn is that repetitive learning and um, best thing you can do, just come up with, with the plan that's going to work for you. As uh, I gave you a couple of examples, preferred activity outside of the building, that's what's going to draw them out. So somewhere that they can go and be safe, but also it's the reward that they get for doing it. And uh, you know, we do a lot of that with, with, with our kids. So, so you can incorporate that into a fire safety drill. And is meeting at your your mailbox, is that far enough? Or how far away do you need to be if, if your house is on fire? Where you, you, wanna, you, you wanna be uh, enough distance away to, to stay safe and, and out of the way of the firefighters too. So depending on where you are, if you can get out onto the sidewalk, away from the driveway, away from the walkways, that would be the best place to meet. Okay, the mailbox, the tree, uh, again, the, the um, family's vehicle. So somewhere like that where you, one, will be safe and two, you'll be out of the way because a fire scene is very chaotic. Okay, there's so much going on. There's uh, firefighters and equipment being moved and you wanna be clear of all of that. So try and find the safest sheltered place away from all this 
motion. Great. Um, Again, it, it's part of your plan. Designate that and stay with it. Okay. I don't see any other questions. It's kind of a last call for questions. If anybody has any questions, I think Bill answered all of them. <laughs> so. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Ramona? Do you have any on your end? Anything more, guys? No? I think we're good on our end, too. So, well, Bill, I want to thank you and uh, Beth from Inland Empire for working with us today and getting this uh, presentation out. Uh, we really, um, I, it, it's just a really sad situation that, you know, with uh, Theta and Mu, uh, just the video alone, just, it, it's so hard. Breaking the, you know, to see that happen, and we don't want that to happen to our families here in, in Kern County or in the Inland uh, Empire area either, anywhere actually. But um, but we we felt the need that it was important to bring this presentation uh, for our families to have it and and know that this is something that one more thing to add to your <laughs> to your list of things you have to do with your child, but. It, it, it applies to every family. It's not just a special needs family, it's every family. And so hopefully today this presentation uh, and the video that you saw of the family that was impacted has, has motivated you to put safety measures in place in your own homes. And so uh, again, we wanna thank um, Bill uh, for doing this presentation for us, for Inland Empire for partnering with us and for our community sponsors, Kern Family Healthcare and Phoenixia for helping us and making it possible. And uh, with that, I, I believe we are done. Um, you guys uh, have anything else to add? Please go ahead and do so, Neil. I just wanted to say thank you to Viviana for translation and interpretation today so we appreciate that. And um, thank you, Ramona. This was your brainchild and um, Bill, I don't know if you saw the thank yous in the chat, but um, we really appreciate your knowledge and your dedication to our community. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, it is so important. And any time we can have a forum to get this information out, we, we need to do it. So uh, we just have to prevent incidents like this from happening again. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, you two, well, we are going to finish with our, uh, we have a drawing here in, um, for those that are here uh, in person and uh, we will uh, go ahead and end this session. Uh, thank you again, everybody for attending. And uh, like I said, uh, just be safe. Be safe and make sure your family has what they need. Yeah, take care everybody. Thank Thanks you for joining us. Bye.